to be together with you because I'm about to introduce our guest. Uh, audit auditorium, and if you don't mind, I will do it in Russian because people are a little bit uh, worrying about the headphones and so on. So I would like to say that today we have our great friend with us, Professor Egermont, who for many years is very well known all over the world, in particular in the oncology world, as a person who had been dealing actively and investigating in the area in melanoma of different types of studies from surgery approaches up to new views, new understandings, specifically about immunotherapy. But for the last several years, he's a director of Gustave Roussy Institution in Paris. As you know, this is one of the leading oncological institutions in France. And currently, we cannot say that it is just melanoma that is in the scope of his interest. Actually, his interest is the whole oncology including very new and very promising area, uh, which is immuno-oncology that we are about to discuss today. That's why it is our greatest pleasure and greatest enthusiasm to meet Dr. Egermont again. And uh, today, I would like to give the floor to him. Professor Egermont, the floor is yours. completed the picture of you since uh, 25 years when I first met you. Uh, saying uh, to people that you uh, was a uh, uh, driving force for many clinical research in melanoma for many, many years. But recently you are a scientific director of uh, Villejuif, uh, the, the biggest cancer center in France, in Europe. And uh, the interests you had uh, on two melanoma you definitely uh, switched to many aspects of clinical research, specifically in immuno-oncology. So, please, go ahead. Thank you. I will need a microphone. Please. Thank you. So, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I'll uh, try to give you an overview of um, what is happening uh, transversely in immunotherapy and uh, we'll start off with utilizing melanoma as the paradigm model but then <coughs> go into a number of tumor types to picture uh, the importance of the current developments. Uh, so the title is, and I think quite rightfully, uh, the title is Revolution Immunotherapy. And I just want to point out that this picture um, identifies the three components that nowadays you must have at a comprehensive cancer center. Uh, you, see, um, you see here we have a number of basic research facilities. Uh, here we have filled up the space with a translational research building with the highest high-tech platforms for sequencing, cell-free DNA circulating, uh, uh, T-cell circulating, uh, tumor cells, um, for creation of molecular portraits, for T-cell receptor cloning, etc., etc. And this building, with all its bioinformatics, is for two-thirds completely dedicated to laboratories who work in connection with clinical trials especially with the Department of Early Phase Clinical Trials. We have created a separate department in the Institute to take care of our Phase I studies. And actually, at this point in time, we are running almost 80 Phase I studies concurrently. That means you need to have a whole setting and a research environment around it with all the laboratory infrastructures to do and carry out phase one studies in immunotherapy as well as in targeted therapy uh, development uh, to make sense of the current biology. And of course, in the background, you see uh, the hospital. So I take the melanoma as the tumor that was so impossible to treat and then became the tumor who provided two models for drug development. On the one hand, mutation-driven drug development. On the other hand, immunotherapy development. 
And I start off with just a couple of remarks on the targeted therapy development so that you appreciate uh, more the differences in terms of benefit, what one approach thus far has brought compared to the immunotherapy uh, approach and where the limitations and difficulties are in these two main fields of uh, new drug development. You all know that about 50% of our melanomas in the Western world have a BRAF mutation that is a driver mutation. If you have this mutation, this pathway is activated and you get a proliferative response uh, that is at the core of the melanoma problem that has a BRAF mutation. This pathway you can block by using BRAF inhibitors, MEK inhibitors, PERC inhibitors, although they are difficult uh, to develop, to shut down this pathway. But immediately you must also appreciate that there is other pathways like the PI3 kinase pathway and a caspase cascade pathway that are usually also perturbed in melanoma and that shutting down just one pathway may not do uh, the job. Now you do know that BRAF inhibitors are associated with very good response rates and that the responses are immediate. You have a important response within two, three weeks compared to the very feeble response rates with DTIC, decarbazine, the old chemotherapy. Now when you see this in terms of response rate, you think that the impact on overall survival must be very important. And then it's not really all that impressive. This is decarbazine, old time chemotherapy, and this is the over, uh, overall survival for the 50% of melanomas with a BRAF mutation that, is treat that are treated with a BRAF inhibitor. And also what you see is that at 18 months, the curves are completely merged again, meaning that it's only a very transient impact that you can have with these targeted therapies. So you may have multiple metastases and a spectacular complete response within four weeks, but you can have a spectacular relapse and reprogression at four or five months. And this shows that it's both a success and a failure story because this patient basically dies four months later than without having received the BRF inhibitor, but he just reprogresses and he will die. Now, the tactics here were to do double blocking of the main pathway by using BRAF and MAC inhibitors in combination. Now, what you hope for when you make a combination of two targeted agents is that you get synergy. And synergy means that one plus one is three. But what you see is that the combination therapy compared to just a BRAF inhibitor alone only gives two curves that are roughly two, two and a half months apart. And so what you see is that it's just a small additive effect. It's certainly not a synergistic effect. So one plus one is one and a half. And unfortunately, one plus one is not three. At long term, because this was just uh, reported at, um, at ASCO, you do see that these curves are very parallel and now here are rejoining parallelity a little bit and that the distance between the two curves has increased to about four months and that you have percentages at three years overall survival of 30 to 40 percent. The main challenge in these mutation driven drug development problems is that you have multiple derailed pathways and by blocking just one you are going to be confronted with resistance mechanisms emerging very rapidly. And so you need to look for nodes of convergence of pathways and block at the node of convergence. One of those nodes, and we showed this in a, an article that we published in Nature uh, last year, is that the node of convergence for the BRAF pathway, the PI3 kinase pathway and the caspase cascade pathway is a nexus at the 
at a node of convergence at the transcriptional level that actually, this is the name, EIF4F, but it's druggable. We have found a drug that is actually used in veterinary medicine that can block transcription at this level. And then you would, with one drug, actually block three pathways. And we've been able to demonstrate that you can treat melanoma resistant to BRAF and MEK inhibitors with these new drugs. This is a long pathway to further develop because the drug was never used in humans. The other major challenge for this mutation, uh, for this pathway approach for drug development is that pathways talk to one another. So when you, when you block one pathway, it may upregulate another pathway. And these are things that are hard to predict because they, they are different depending on what was the organ of origin of your tumor. And just to give you the biggest example, melanoma, you have about 80% of patients responding to a BRAF inhibitor if they have the BRAF mutation uh, in terms of a CR, a PR, or stable disease. But the same mutation in colon cancer gives only a 5% response rate. And this is a very severe challenge to the whole concept that we proclaimed that if a tumor has a target and you have a drug against that target, it will work across the board against various tumors as long as tumors have that target. This, unfortunately, is not true because that BRAF mutation in colon cancer spells, uh, <coughs> plays a completely different role and is not a driver mutation in colon cancer. And therefore, treatment with a BRAF inhibitor for BRAF mutant colon cancer is a very poor drug choice. So it challenges the whole concept that was a premise for personalized cancer medicine and targeted uh, uh, therapy for uh, pathway interruption is that targeted agents will be effective across different tumor types with that target? The answer is simply no, that is not the case. So we are challenged by a situation which is three-dimensional, which this is a melanoma cell line with a BRAF mutation. The BRAF mutation is the central engine for this melanoma cell line. You can shut it down with a BRAF inhibitor but you see that there are multiple consequences of a BRAF mutation, meaning that you can instinctively see that a BRAF inhibitor cannot completely shut down the central engine. On top of that, you have other zones, mutational zones in this melanoma cell line in the P53 domain for which we have no drugs and in the TGF beta uh, uh, domain for which we now start to have drugs that demonstrate that even if you cross out the central engine, the side engines will kick into action and will cause reprogression and are responsible for resistance mechanisms. So those are the challenges for that part of drug development. So the interesting thing about the immune system is that it has been around since life has been around. And so it's an extremely savvy system to protect organisms against invasive organisms that are non-self. So it's a basic mechanism that has a readout system to recognize whether it's a virus, a bacteria, a parasite, or whether it's a tumor cell and therefore is completely different wired as a, differently wired as a system to see what is different and then attack it, to tackle it. So immunotherapy has been, of course, the dream of everybody since long, and there are some hallmarks in the history of immunotherapy development, that is the discovery of the dendritic cell, totally crucial because it's the cell that presents the antigen of a virus or a bacteria or et cetera to the immune system. Uh, it's the creation of tumor specific monoclonal antibodies, which for 25 years were only used in the diagnostic setting, but now are the revolution in uh, cancer therapy. And we've had, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
<coughs> adoptive uh, T-cell immunotherapy that has developed, interleukin-2, interferon-alpha, etc. And vaccines. The problem with the immunotherapeutic approach has always been that we thought we could fix the problem by activating the immune system, and we found out that we could activate the immune system only for a very short period of time, and then it would go into a neutral or suppressed phase, and we could induce some responses, but almost never long-lasting responses. So why is it that the immune system always goes down into a tolerance situation? So with interleukin-2, we saw some patients with a complete response or with a partial response who then were long-lasting control acquisition patients over their tumor. But they were very, very minority uh, group of patients. This was somewhere between 5 and 10 percent and not more. And so we could not really base a strategy on kicking the immune system in the bud and activate it. So the concept that has completely changed immunotherapy and that is at the basis of the current revolution in immunotherapy is that we now realize that breaking tolerance is the key to making the uh, immune system work. What does it mean? It means that the immune system of cancer patients is fundamentally suppressed and in an energic state and that if you cannot unblock a, a blocked immune system, you can try to activate as much as you want, but you will not get there. So to unblock the system is by using inhibitors to inhibit inhibitors, to unblock the system, rather than to use activators into a system that remains essentially blocked. And the model for this is anti-CTLA-4, is ipilimumab, because this was the first fundamental discovery to demonstrate that unblocking the immune system would have very, very large consequences. You know that when an antigen-presenting cell, dendritic cell, presents, let's say, the antigen of a virus to a T cell, you need co-stimulation, and what happens with the T cell? Two things. It is created to become a cytotoxic T cell with specificity against the virus, and this interaction creates a proliferation of those T cells to create an army of activated cytotoxic T cells. Now, already within 36 to 48 hours, what happens? The immune system already immediately, within 48 hours, says, whoa, 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 I don't need more of this. Let's not overstimulate. Let's not overreact. We need to contain the amount of activated T cells that we produce. And so the T cells express CTLA-4. That interacts also with B7 in a way that's even preferential. And so the whole T cell programming goes down, 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 and is down-regulated. And that's the end of that T cell programming. The army has been created. It's of a certain size, and it should be sufficient to get rid of the virus. This is, luckily, what we have as a normally functioning immune system. If you would not put the brakes on the immune system, none of us would be sitting here because we would all suffer from fatal autoimmune diseases. So this is a good thing, but in trying to remobilize or expand the immune system against tumors, where you have continuous antigens being presented to program T cells, you cannot work with a T cell programming system that is shut down. You need to unblock that system, and you do that by putting in an anti-CTLA-4 monoclonal antibody to prevent that this will happen. And if you block this one, then the antigen presentation and proliferation of T cells and creating multiple neoantigen-driven 
cytotoxic T cell armies is in place, and then you have a scenario where these CTL armies can eradicate tumors. So this is the fundamental discovery. The two crucial inhibitory receptors on T cells thus far have been identified as being CTLA-4 and PD-1. There are multiple other additional candidates that we can also utilize to further unblock the immune system. And then we have the other receptors on T cells which are activating center, uh, cell, uh, receptors. So if you interact with those, you push an on button for proliferation and programming. So what do the ipilimumab uh, data tell us and how did this become uh, to become a, a very important drug? Well, so my, the man who influenced uh, my, my scientific career more than anybody else was Steve Rosenberg and he designed this trial. He was actually the clinical development person for anti-CTLA-4 because he already had done everything in melanoma and in renal cell cancer in the year 2004. That's six, six years before the drug was approved and he did it at the NCI. So this is just a peptide vaccine. And this is ipilimumab alone, and this is ipilimumab plus the peptide vaccine. In patients who have failed one or two lines of systemic therapy for metastatic melanoma. And there's two observations. The curves start to diverge after three months, which is indicative that it takes time for manipulating the immune system to see the effect coming. But most importantly, there was the observation that anybody who was out two and a half years and who was um, not progressing and not dying was not progressing and not dying at three years and not at four years. And it was the first time we saw a tail in the survival curve of melanoma patients of around 20%. So where five-year survival rates for melanoma before were below 5%. Now, it looked like we were looking at 20%. Was that true? Well, it turned out to be true. Here are almost 5,000 patients treated with ipilimumab, and you see that anybody who is beyond two and a half, three years will remain there and will be also alive at five years and even at 10 years, meaning that 20% of the patient population is basically cured, and that we had never seen before. Now, you can argue 20%. That's not much, but the essence is that it used to be 4%. So it's five times better than it, was, than it used to be. So something fundamental has changed. Then there was a combination trial of decarbazine versus decarbazine plus ipilimumab. It also showed, again, that if you are out beyond two and a half years and you have ipilimumab, there seems to be a plateau that's unbroken. And that was confirmed at five and eight, and at, uh, eight years. But this chemotherapeutic drug did not help ipilimumab at all. We would have had exactly the same results with ipilimumab alone. Because decarbazine is not a cyto toxic drug that leads to immunogenic cell death. And if it doesn't lead to immunogenic cell death, it really doesn't prime or co-prime by creating new antigens to help the immune system. So this combination is not uh, further uh, used or advised. So before ipilimumab was approved, I wrote uh, an adjuvant protocol with, ipil with ipilimumab in 2008, 2009, uh, which um, was activated in 2010, even before approval of ipilimumab. And we treated 951 patients in the adjuvant setting who were lymph node positive with a high relapse risk. <clears throat> and they were randomized between ipilimumab versus placebo. This is the schedule. Ipilimumab, four doses, 
three weeks apart, followed by a maintenance regimen where they would receive ipilimumab once every three months for up to three years versus placebo. And this was reported and published in the Lancet Oncology. This is the primary endpoint of the trial. It's recurrence-free survival. You see the curve for ipilimumab and you see the curve for placebo patients. And what it showed was that at this relatively short time follow-up, there were 60 patients more who had relapsed in the placebo arm than in the ipilimumab arm, has a ratio of 0.75 and a, a significant p-value, of course. And that at three-year relapse-free rates, there was a difference of about 12% between having received uh, ipilimumab or having received placebo. Now, when you dig in deeper into the data, there is a group of patients who are sentinel node positive and enter the trial, and there is a group of pa patients who enter the trial with palpable nodal disease. Now, what that shows is that the best benefit in terms of hazard ratio was obtained in patients who were, who were sentinel node positive compared to patients who were macroscopically or palpable node positive, 0.64 versus 0.80. So we had seen this before with interferon, but the difference was that now in palpable nodes with ipilimumab, we still had a significant impact also in patients with palpable nodal disease. And just to show you what is the difference, these are 2,644 patients in two adjuvant interferon trials uh, that I conducted within the EURTC. Microscopic, so sentinel node positive patients had a benefit of interferon over placebo, but palpable nodal patients never showed any benefit of adjuvant interferon over placebo. And here you see the ipilimumab outcome. The effect on sentinel node positive disease is bigger than with the interferon trials. And for the first time, we also see an effect, which actually is significant, between ipilimumab and uh, placebo for palpable nodal disease patients. But another way for which we also stratified was, how did the melanoma start in these patients? Was it a non-ulcerated melanoma, 70% of the patient population, or an ulcerated melanoma? And we all know that an ulcerated melanoma has much worse prognosis. So much worse that there's got to be a difference in biology. Because if you control for breast low thickness, the ulcerated melanoma has a worse survival of 10 to 25 percent uh, compared to non-ulcerated melanoma. That is a difference that's too big to not represent a, bio a biology behind it. So this is a meta-analysis that we will publish in uh, The Lancet uh, later uh, this year. Because we discovered within our EURTC trials that ulceration, and I already published that in, in 2012 and uh, this year for the big trials, ulceration was the most important predictive factor for interferon sensitivity. But when you take all 15 adjuvant trials of interferon versus placebo that were done in the world, this is the outcome. Non-ulcerated primaries, 70% of the patient population, all the adjuvant interferon trials together had no impact at all, no benefit at all for patients who started with a non-ulcerated primary. All the effect of adjuvant interferon was only reserved for patients who had an ulcerated primary, so it's different biology. And you can see here, this is the interferon curve and this is the placebo curve. So. We asked the same question, Fun. Is that a day and night, black and white difference, uh, like in interferon? Or what's the situation for ipilimumab? And now it's interesting. You see that the ulcerated patients, for all patients, 
do better than the patients without an ulceration. That in microscopic central node positive patients, if they started with an ulcerated primary, the hazard ratio is even 0.50. And that in palpable node, it's 0.68 for the ulcerated. But you see as well that there is still an effect in non-ulcerated melanomas that is each time also significant. Not as big as is in ulcerated melanoma, but still now it's an effect that you see across the board of all patients. So with ipilimumab in our trial, all patients had a benefit from adjuvant ip ipilimumab, but the ones with an ulcerated melanoma had the biggest benefit. Now we all know that, that ipilimumab induces autoimmune phenomena, immune-related adverse events. And these are the timelines along which immune-related adverse events emerge. And you can see these are the number of doses. And basically, you see that most of all the immune-related adverse events happen in the first three, four, five doses. Because at four or five doses, you are basically for dermatitis, for uh, gastrointestinal, so this is colitis, for hepatitis, and for endocrine, uh, it's mostly hypo, uh, um, it's, it's mostly hypothyroiditis, but it's also uh, uh, <coughs> um, hypophysitis. Um, uh, that it's all happening in those first four or five doses. Um, so that means that more than 50% of the patients already came off treatment in that period of four or five doses. And there were few patients who went on to go on to maintenance treatment. That also means that the observed effect of the adjuvant ipilimumab, which is significant for relapse-free survival for all patients involved, was mainly produced by four or five doses of ipilimumab. Just like in the metastatic set setting that we know, and this is miracle, it's really miraculous, that four or five doses of ipilimumab basically do the job and switch the immune system from, from off into on, and switch it into on for a very long time. Do we understand that? No, not really. But do we observe it? Yes, we do. So then we move on to the second unblocker of the immune system. It's anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-L1. And these are the drugs of the years for, you know, years in a row. Because now we are looking not at T-cell programming, which was blocked and unblocked by anti-CTLA-4, but now we are looking at the execution phase of CTL toxicity at the tumor level. And what happens there is that tumor cells express PD-L1 and they engage with PD-1 on cytotoxic T cells that have arrived in the tumor to kill tumor cells, and now they neutralize completely the functioning of the T cells. So, if you have an anti-PD-1 or an anti-PD-L1 antibody and you can prevent this interaction, your, your cytotoxic T cells on site in the tumor can kill the tumor. And actually, we found out they will. And so anti-PD-1 molecules, so nivolumab and pembrolizumab, are molecules that have extraordinary efficacy and have a very favorable side effect <clears throat> profile. Why? Because it's a peripheral phenomenon and we see very little autoimmune-related events with anti-PD-1, but we see much higher response rates. Look here with pembrolizumab in this case, these are the response rates in metastatic melanoma. This looks like a BRAF inhibitor for BRAF mutated melanoma, but the difference is this is for all melanoma patients, not just for BRAF mutated melanoma patients. But this is, of course, the most interesting and most important phenomenon is that when you are a responder, you will be a responder for a long time. And the median duration of response is two years with anti-PD-1, whereas the median duration of response for a BRAF inhibitor in a BRAF mutated melanoma is just for four and a half months.
So this is going to have a clear impact on overall survival. And this is what it shows. If you randomize chemotherapy against anti-PD-1, you see a massive impact on overall survival. Just compare it. These are BRF mutated melanomas treated with a BRF inhibitor compared to chemotherapy. Here you have the same chemotherapy and you treat now all melanomas and this is the impact on overall survival. So anti-PD-1 is of phen phenomenal importance and has as a follow-up to and as a, a, a completing agent to anti-CTLA-4 really changed the whole world of immunotherapy. It's equally effective in BRAF mutant or BRAF wild type uh, melanomas. It's the same. Anti-PD-1 doesn't care whether you have a BRAF mutation, yes or no. And you see five-year survival rates with just anti-PD-1 of around 40%. That is true for nivolumab, it's also true for pembrolizumab, at least here you see the three-year survival rates that were just uh, reported at uh, ASCO to be 40 and 45%. Uh, so per se, anti-PD-1 is more active than anti-CTLA-4, which has been demonstrated in a randomized controlled trial. This is ipilimumab, this is anti-PD-1, in this case pembrolizumab. But the interesting thing will become, and this is at the end of the story, that you can combine them. But first I need to treat the phenomenon that for the first time we see a transversal impact across all different tumor types with immunotherapy. We have never seen that before. Before, immunotherapy were, was a hobby for strange people like Lev and myself, and it was just working in melanoma and in renal cell cancer, and nobody took us seriously. Uh, now, however, we're looking at the most transversal development we have witnessed in cancer medicine, because this is what's happening. You see efficacy in melanoma, in non-small cell lung cancer, in head and neck cancer, in bladder cancer and renal cancer, in gastric and esophageal cancer, in hepatocellular cancer, which is not on this slide, in triple negative breast cancer. And you see phenomenal activity in Hodgkin lymphoma in patients who have already failed five lines of therapy. So how come? Well, how come? Look here at lung cancer, second line. Non small cell lung cancer, but the squamous type. This is anti-PD-1. This is uh, Texotere. And you see that you see a doubling of overall survival at 12 months. And so all of a sudden, where it took us 20 years in lung cancer to improve median survival rates from 9 to 12 months with a couple of drugs that were all approved for just marginal activity, now all of a sudden there's an agent that takes that median from 12 to 24 months. And it's just a monoclonal antibody with very little toxicity. Um, the more PDL1 expression you have on your tumor, the better you will do and the better you will respond to anti PD1. It's also true for non small cell lung cancer, but not as much as for squamous non small cell lung cancer. You see an effect of anti PD1, but it's not as big as in, non -squamous, as in squamous non small cell lung cancer. And here, you basically must have a lot of PDL1 expression to be effective because if it's less than 10%, anti PD1 is not better than Texotere. If it's bigger than 10%, the impact is massive. And so, for this indication, I think it's going to be restricted to patients with more than 10% PDL1 positivity of their tumors. Now, head and neck tumors look very much like lung tumors. You'll remember what was the impact? on squamous cell, non-small cell lung cancer. Now you look at head and neck cancer. It almost looks the same. And again, you have a doubling of overall survival at one year compared to, in this case, physician's choice, second line therapy in head and neck cancer. What does it mean by extrapolation? That you can see these drugs moving up in first line in lung cancer, squamous, in head and neck, 
and in a number of other tumor types. So this will be approved too for head and neck. Uh, for the first time, we have a drug that creates control in about 50% of patients with a mesothelioma that lasts longer than 12 months. We have never had a drug that controls mesothelioma for longer than 12 months. We, for the first time, sorry, we, for the first time, have a drug that controls gastric cancer for longer than a year in patients who have failed two lines of chemotherapy. They have a life expectancy, a median of three months. And so I, I foresee that this will also be approved later this year in second line for uh, gastric cancer. In renal cell cancer, it, there was a randomized trial against Everolimus. And it's superior to what was supposed to be the best drug for renal cell cancer and was approved uh, for renal cell cancer. And we just had azito, uh, azitolizumab uh, approved an anti-PDL1 molecule in bladder cancer. And the same thing will happen with the anti-PD1s with nivolumab and uh, pembrolizumab. They're just a little bit behind in this particular pathology. So that's another tumor that where nothing happened over the last 30 years. We are still, and we're still treating bladder cancer the same way like 30 years ago because nothing works. It's the first report on triple negative breast cancer. And Merkel cell carcinoma is very active, like melanoma, tremendous activity with anti-PD-1 in Merkel cell carcinoma. And this, of course, the Hodgkin lymphoma story is totally incredible because these patients who had no options at all of treatment, who had failed even bone marrow transplantation as fifth-line therapy, an overall response rate of 85% and a complete response rate of 20% and a PR rate of 45% and more than 80% of patients are still in these remissions, meaning that just one monoclonal antibody can completely change the outcome of Hodgkin lymphoma, which we thought we had more or less cured. This is very important, and that is that tumors who have a mismatch repair deficiency are the ones who create so many neoantigens that they are the ones who are most likely to respond to anti-PD-1 treatment. This was a study done at, in Hopkins, and it was confirmed by numbers much more important in, ter in terms of numbers of patients. Now we have 25 patients here, we have 35 here, and we have 35 here meaning that mismatched repair deficient colorectal cancer, that's MSI colorectal cancer, it's 8% of your colorectal cancers. They have now in the updated uh, uh, report of ASCO this year, a 62% response rate to anti-PD-1. If you have your garden variety colorectal cancer, actually we, you have a response rate of 0%. We don't fully understand this, but it's the observation. And now if you take a number of different tumors, there are ovarian cancers, endometrial cancers, synoviosarcomas, leiomyosarcomas, there are even prostate cancers inside this group of patients. And if you have a mismatched repair deficiency, the response rate is 72% to anti-PD-1. And so I predict that MSI diagnostic tool kits will become a screening tool for solid tumors to identify your likelihood as a patient with a solid tumor to respond and benefit from anti-PD-1. So this is now the situation. Anti-PD-1 is the most important drug in the history of cancer medicine. It already has been approved in melanoma, renal, bladder, lung, two types of lung. It is going to be approved in head and neck and esophagus and stomach pretty soon. It's going to be improved. This is a tough one for the FDA and EMA, how to decide it. For patients who are MSI positive, it's going to be an interesting dossier. It, and it already has been approved for Hodgkin. So we have never seen anything like this. And before it's the end of 2018, it will have been approved in 15 different tumor types. So for a center like mine, which is a very high volume of activity, this has organizational consequences because these patients get nivolumab, pembrolizumab every two or three weeks. So we now have organized Thursday as an anti-PD-1 day. So our whole outpatient clinic facility 
which has 120 beds and chairs, where we have three sessions per day. So that's 360 sessions per day. On Thursday, we only use one drug, it's anti-PD-1, to deal with all the lung cancer, head and neck cancer patients, melanoma patients, renal cell cancer patients, et cetera, et cetera. So it's completely changing our way of practice. We know that the ones who react best are the ones with a high mutational load, but the MSI tumors are also in tumors with lower mutational load. And so you will see this circle go also there, but provided these tumors are MSI. The last few slides on the combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab. Because these two monoclonal antibodies, they work at different stages of T cell functioning. Anti-CTLA4 mostly in programming of T cells and anti-PD-1 in retaining CTL executive functioning. And so you can combine them. And look what happens when you combine them. You see a response rate now of 57 or 59%, so 60%, compared to an ipilimumab response rate alone of around 15%. And you see this, this is the combo response rate compared to ipilimumab alone. It has been randomized in melanoma to compare nivo mono combo, nivo ipi combo versus nivo alone versus ipi alone. And again, so it's 60%, 40%, and in this case, 19%, but it's now down to 15, 1.5% uh, response rates. And you see three separate curves. And what you see, this is just progression-free survival. And so what you see is that this now evolves into potentially a new standard therapy where if we can reduce the dose of IPI in this combination, it will be also manageable regarding toxicity. So. Breaking tolerance is the central prerequisite for immunocombo development. And now you can also combine it with all sorts of activation strategies because provided you have created breaking tolerance, all the other options become valid again. And so many other approaches that were basically dead in immunotherapeutic approaches now have become alive again, have a second life, within the context of breaking tolerance. That is also true for some combos with chemo, radiation therapy, and targeted therapies. And so here are my predictions. So immunocombo development will dominate the drug development scene for years to come. Breaking tolerance is the essential prerequisite. It will get the Nobel Prize next year. It will be the essential backbone for any treatment, not just of metastatic melanoma patients, but for many, many, many other patients. We had a report on lung cancer patients with a 57% response rate in lung cancer for the combination of IPI plus NIVO. New antigens, private antigens that are being released are being utilized by the immune system now and will further increase our understanding. And we are I say, it says will cure, but actually we are already curing more than 50% of patients with metastatic melanoma with the combo of ipilimumab and nivolumab at this particular point in time. And so it's a true revolution in immunotherapy. And in case you come to Paris, it's not just a great city. We're here and you're welcome to visit. Thank you very much. Well, well, well. Thank you so much for the short form of history of cancer treatment we have from you here. And certainly uh, plenty of questions must come to you from the audience, but uh, okay, okay. Uh, maybe the, the first question I will address from myself to you. Uh, it concerns the ipilimumab and two different doses used. I mean, three or ten millions. Uh, you, uh, three or ten milligrams. Yeah. And is it an equal one from your point of view or different by biological activity? Um. Well, in, 
you know there's a randomized trial between 3 and 10 milligrams that will be reported perhaps even this year at ESMO, I don't know, if not uh, uh, next year. I will be reporting the overall survival data, uh, by the way, at ESMO uh, this year of the adjuvant trial. Uh, so we do not know yet the outcome in metastatic disease of the randomized trial of 3 versus 10 milligrams per ki uh, kilogram. I would be surprised if it's significantly different, but I don't know. I'm just telling you that I would be surprised. Because in general, the dose response effect with ipilimumab and with nivolumab is, is, very, um, is not a yes-no type of phenomenon at all. And this is one of the reasons why now, with anti-PD-1, we're going into flat dosing uh, pembrolizumab already started that, but now also nivolumab is starting flat dosing programs to make it much more easy to give a general dose range that is effective. And uh, so um, I don't think it's going to make a difference, quite honestly. Okay, thank you. And another one question uh, regarding EP and adjuvant treatment in melanoma patients. Yeah. We know for many years interference occupied the scene completely and we know the results which were in the beginning pretty the same between uh, EP and uh, uh, results of interference. So uh, what do you think about this? Yeah, so my opinion about adjuvant interference is completely different from uh, current practice uh, because we have shown that adjuvant interferon only makes sense in patients with an ulcerated primary melanoma. It's the only biology that is sensitive to adjuvant interferon and uh, it makes no use at all to prescribe adjuvant interferon to patients with, who started with an unulcerated melanoma. And the ultimate proof is in the meta-analysis where the impact of adjuvant interferon therapy on patients who started with a non-ulcerated melanoma is zero. It's not just a little bit, it is zero. So, uh, already in a number of guidelines, uh, the prescription of uh, adjuvant uh, interferon is uh, no longer uh, supported uh, for 70% of the patient population, namely those who started with a non-ulcerated primary. So, for me, only ulcerated melanoma is an option for adjuvant uh, interferon. The interesting thing is that in the ipilimumab trial, we show a significant effect for both groups of patients be they, be they um, ulcerated or non-ulcerated, but the ulcerated still do best. But so, in the long run, it will substitute, I mean, EP substitute uh, this setting for adjuvant treatment of melanoma patients. Uh, yes, uh, certainly until uh, the anti-PD-1 comes along because, you know, those trials mm -hmm. have also been uh, conducted. Uh, BMS ran a trial uh, comparing NIVO versus IPI in the adjuvant setting. I am currently uh, finalizing the uh, accrual at 1,200 uh, patients screened for PAMBRO versus placebo. Uh -huh. I mean, the anti-PD-1 data will emerge um, 2019. So there is going to be, uh, uh, for years, uh, a clear space for adjuvant uh, ipilimumab in purple, in um, both sentinel node positive as well as palpable node positive melanoma patients. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And prepare yourself to probably more questions sure. from the floor. Uh, uh, where yeah, the yeah. headphones? Just a second. Let Professor Egermont to put his headsets on. So the others may not get him. So it's better if you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Microphone. Microphone. Speak any language you like. She will speak English. Two drug, but it comes from your slides, and uh, we know very well that uh, for now we know for different receptor for suppressors for T cells, for myeloid cells, for NTAR cells, TNF group cells, and we have a lot new monoclonal antibodies against different uh, suppressor cells. Yeah. What do you think? Is it necessary? to look immunology, is it necessary to use this drug or another drug? Because 
All this investigation is coming without any scientific research in, in immunology. I don't know if it's coming without any scientific research. I have, I have shown that there is many activating receptors on T cells yeah. and there's many inhibitory receptors yes. on T cells. And against most of these receptors, now we have monoclonal antibodies. And at this point in time, based on uh, basically uh, murine tumor data, where the combos have been explored, for instance, Ipilimumab plus anti-OX40, and Ipilimumab plus anti-LAC3, Ipilimumab plus uh, Gitter, etc., show that in murine tumor models, there are additional immune combos that seem extremely promising, but that now have only just entered phase one studies in human patients, in, in, in human beings. So I am personally convinced that there will be a couple of other immune combos that will be identified within the next three years that may be very promising and may be of additional values for specific tumor types, perhaps, uh, and will be perhaps as effective as uh, ipilimumab plus nivolumab, as anti-CTLA4 plus anti-PD1. I just think that a central molecule in the combo strategy development will be anti-PD1 because it has so low toxicity and therefore it offers you the space of an additional molecule to be explored. I make one more comment to this though. For the agonists, so OX40, uh, CD137, yes. uh, CD28, uh, the problem with the agonist antibodies is that you can push the T cells too easily into a se secondary cytokine storm and they are much more difficult to develop, the agonists, than the inhibitory blocking uh, monoclonal antibody. So we'll see how it pans out because the, the mouse data are unbelievable. But right now, at this point in time, we have trouble developing anti-CD137 and we have uh, problems developing OX40, because it's so sensitive with the patients, it's much more difficult to find a dose that is not giving a lot of toxicity with agonists. So I, I, I see that we will be exploring these immunocombo developments for quite a few years to come to find out which biology we can handle and which will be perhaps too, too complex to handle. We'll find out. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Thank you.